Crux is a DIY Bitcoin hardware signing device, very similar to the Seed Signer. It recently had a major release and this release had an important milestone reproducible builds, meaning that even if you can't compile and build the code yourself, other members within the community who do have the technical background can all do this independently of each other and attest that the software that they are seeing on their systems matches what is officially being distributed by the project. So in this video, I'm just gonna run through everything you need to know to be able to build Crux yourself from source, as well as just showing you how the output of that process matches the latest official releases from Crux. So let's get into it. And if you haven't already done so, hit subscribe and that way you can stay in the loop for content I make to help you find your way in the crazy and often hostile environment that is cryptocurrency. So I'm just going to be doing this process in Windows just because that's the platform that most people are on. But the very first step of this process is going to be installing and running the Windows subsystem for Linux, which essentially means that the process for this video will actually be exactly the same as what you would do in Linux, uh, with a small exception in terms of how you actually install Docker. But other than that, everything is pretty much the same. All right, so here I have a fresh install of Windows 11. And the first thing we're gonna do is open up an administrator PowerShell. So I'm just gonna type in power, and then we want to open PowerShell. And I just wanna run that as an administrator. Yep. And the first command I wanna do here, which will just turn Windows subsystem for Linux on is WSL hyphen hyphen install. And then I just hit enter. And there we go. So as you can see here, we now need to do a restart. So we'll just reboot that system. Okay, and we're back. So now what we're gonna do, hmm. Now, the important thing to say here is that WSL2, that's Windows Subsystem for Linux version two, does need some things enabled in your BIOS to work. So if you see an error message like this one, basically you need to enable something in your BIOS. And the other issue may be that you simply don't have that feature turned on in Windows. So I click the start menu here, just type in features for search. Uh, we want this one here, turn Windows features on and off. And we just wanna make sure that the virtual machine platform is enabled. In this case it is, so that's not the problem. So let's shut that down. I'm cheating on a virtual machine, so I'll now turn that on. So we'll hit start and we'll type in Ubuntu because that's what it installed by default. So now this is working. So we set a new username, so we can call it anything. I'll just call it CryptoGuide. And we set a Linux password. That is what we're gonna use in WSL. So I'll just set that to crypto guide. There we go. And there we go. So now we have a Ubuntu shell running within Windows subsystem for Linux. So WSL is working, we are good to go. All right, so now we can install Docker. And the one thing I'll say here is there are actually two ways you can do this. You can actually just install Docker within Windows subsystem for Linux, just like you would install it in Linux. Alternatively, you can use Docker Desktop, which installs just like any other Windows application, gives you a nice sort of graphical interface to what is happening in Docker, and also allows multiple other applications on your system to be able to make use of the functionality that Docker makes available. There are important differences in terms of licensing you need to be aware of, but for most home users, that's not gonna matter. Either method is fine, but for this video, I'll be using Docker Desktop. So we'll just head over to the Docker website and we are just gonna download for Windows. And once we've downloaded the installer, we will just run it. And we'll just say, okay. And once that's done, we'll just click this to restart the computer yet again. And once we've restarted, the Docker install will keep going. So we have to accept the subscription agreement. And it'll prompt us to create an account, but we'll just continue without signing in because we don't need that. We can just say other, doesn't matter. And just say next. There we go, and now we are good to go. Now, the important thing I'll say about Docker Desktop is if you're someone who doesn't use Windows subsystem for Linux for anything other than just following this tutorial video, all the defaults for Docker will just work. However, if you have multiple WSL instances, you do need to give permission to them to be able to access all of the functionality of Docker. Doing that is straightforward. You just click on this little cog here, go onto resources, go into WSL integration and just enable all of the different WSL environments that you want to be able to access 
uh, Docker. This only matters if you have multiple different environments for WSL on your system, but if you do get a message that says you know it can't find Docker, uh, just check out this setting. You might need to enable it in there. So we'll leave Docker Desktop running. You can just minimize it if you want it out of the way, but you do need to have the Docker engine running for any of this to work. So we're going to go here and we're going to run Ubuntu, which we just installed before. And now we're going to download Crux. So we're going to head over to the Crux repository and the first thing we're going to do is just clone it onto our system. So we'll go back here into our Ubuntu environment. We'll just type in git clone recursive and then we'll just paste, right click to paste the repository for Crux in there. And once we've cloned that repository, we just need to change into the Crux folder. So we'll type in cd Crux. And just to make sure the code we're building matches an official release that we want to verify against, we're going to go into the releases page. And what we want here is this tag uh, for the release. So I'm going to copy that. And basically now that we're in the folder for Crux, we'll just type in git, check out, and then we'll just put in the tag, and then we hit enter. And now our local repository contains the source code that was used for this official release. And if we just type in ls, we can see that there. But if we want to build the source, basically we are going to use this script here, which is called crux. So we're just going to type in dot slash crux, and then we're going to say build. And I want to build for this makes Amiga because there's a nice big four inch screen. So here I'll just type in makes pi Amigo and hit enter. And that will go. All right, so this is the part of the process where really you want to just go and do something else for a little while and come back. Depending on your hardware, this process could take up to a couple of hours. Okay, and there we go. So that process is finished and it spat out these two files here and we can actually just do a SHA-256 sum of them. So SHA-256 sum, there we go. So there is the firmware.bin and we can check the SHA-256 sum of the K package. There we go. And if we just go back to the releases page on GitHub and download the official release for those files, go to where we downloaded it, just extract it. And then go into the makes Amigo build. We see that we have the same files here. And if I just right click in there, open in terminal, and just say get file hash, and what are the two file names? firmware.bin. And kboot. I can see that the checksum for both the firmware file as well as for the kboot file are completely identical. And this is not only useful for me being able to have confidence that I've done things like build the source code correctly and that I can safely run this on my device, but also helps the rest of the community be confident that the official builds uh, for this device that I've built from source can be trusted. You can use exactly the same process to build and verify any of these other supported platforms. So for example, uh, I can just say here that I want to build for the M5 stick V and just hit enter and basically it will just rebuild that source uh, on my computer for the M5 stick V. And fortunately, once you've run through a full build once, all of the subsequent builds you do are much faster than the original build process. And as you can see here, rebuilding for the M5 stick V was done in under two minutes. And just like last time, we can see that both of the hashes exactly match what we would expect. Now, in terms of how you flash these firmware files onto the hardware, one of the challenges with using the Windows subsystem for Linux compared to just using a proper Linux system is that connecting USB devices into it and just flashing the firmware directly from within WSL is a bit of a chore. Uh, it's actually just much easier to use the standard flash tools that you'd use to flash any of the uh, normal builds for Crux, and I'll just show you how to do that. So I'll just quickly rebuild that for the Amiga. And while that's happening, basically what we're going to do is we're going to go to the folder where we unzipped the official release for Crux because it actually comes with the K tool here. And uh, basically we are just going to use this. So I'm just going to right click there and just say open in terminal. 
And what we're going to do here is just type in the same commands we would for flashing crux from official releases that I cover in this video over here. And we're in PowerShell, so we'll start with a dot slash, and we'll type in ktool, hit tab, now we want win. We'll put in the sort of default parameters for flashing firmware like this. And to find the firmware files, basically, if we just go back into Windows Explorer, click over here on Linux, we can actually find the file system for our WSL instance. So if I click into Ubuntu, go into Home, go into Crypto Guide, go into Crux, and go into the build folder. These are the two firmware files here that we just built before. So what I'm going to do is right click on that KF package one, just copy as path, minimize that, and just right click to paste it in there, which you'll see it basically says wsl.localhost and the path we get here is exactly the same as the path uh, we saw down here. We'll just plug in our makes amigo and turn it on. And basically once that is connected, we can just press enter. Didn't like that. Wait a minute, we'll just check that the ports are there in Device Manager, which they are. So let's just try that again. Maybe we didn't give it long enough to detect it, so we'll just press Enter. There we go. And there we go. So this is now running Crux, which we built and verified ourselves. So there you go. Certainly more technical than what the average user might be used to, but still something that is definitely very achievable, uh, just even on your standard Windows desktop. And something that can not only help you to have increased confidence in the software you're running on your DIY signing device, but also help contribute to the broader community being able to have decentralized trust in the integrity of these software releases. If you're someone who wants to give Crux a go, the Telegram group for Crux is actually a really great place to go just to ask any questions you might have about which hardware you might use and where you might source it from, as well as running into help for any issues you might run into along the way. Crux is also a lot more accessible than it was 12 months ago when I did my first videos on it, and there is now a graphical installer that you can use that can help download, verify, and flash the uh, Crux firmware onto hardware for you. So again, a fantastic DIY option for Bitcoin hardware signing. If you have any questions about this process or you get stuck, definitely also just leave a reply in the comments section. I do my best to reply to all of them. And other than that, stay safe. Thanks for watching, I hope that was helpful. Hit like if you think that other people would find this video useful and hit subscribe if you'd like to be kept in the loop about future content I make that helps people stay safe in the crypto space and to recover if they get into trouble. If you have any questions about this video or a topic that you'd like me to cover, just leave a reply.